everyone. Thank you so much for joining me today for this webinar on uh, green card options for E2 visa holders. My name is Dustin Saldariaga, and I am a senior associate with Scott Legal PC. <clears throat> the E2 visa is one of the most common visas that our firm handles, and it really is a wonderful option for anyone who is a uh, citizen of an E2 treaty country who wants to come to the United States to develop and direct a business. Um, one of the things our firm specializes in is helping people uh, start uh, lower investment businesses. So some of some of our clients have included tattoo parlors, people who are starting convenience stores, um, uh, delis, um, private schools, smaller businesses uh, with investment amounts in the hundred thousand dollar range. Now, at times, the success of those businesses will lead to the possibility that they may apply for a green card or permanent residence in the United States. Uh, an E-2 visa is a non-immigrant visa, so it doesn't lead to a green card directly. Uh, we'll talk about that a bit more, but the option does sometimes come up for, uh, for those who are on an E-2 visa. Um, and that's the focus of this webinar. Um, I will be sharing with you at the end of this webinar the PowerPoint presentation that you see on your screen, as well as a link to our YouTube channel where we post a variety of videos on uh, visa options to come to the United States. Um, I will also share with you a link where you can get the recording of this webinar. This webinar is being recorded. Um, and if you have any questions, I will be monitoring on Zoom uh, any questions that come in. So please do feel free to send those in by using either the Q&A function or the chat function on Zoom. Uh, I will be actively monitoring those and I'll either answer the question when it comes in or, uh, or at least I, I, I think we should have time for all questions by the end of the presentation. So don't hesitate to send those. Uh, to send those in. So uh, to go ahead and dive in, let's start by talking about how the green card system works in the United States. So unlike some countries which have a point system and, and based on a certain number of points that you receive by, for example, speaking uh, the, the native language, you may get some points. That is not how it works in the United States. In the United States, you need to independently qualify for the specific green card option you're pursuing. So the two broad buckets of green cards are family-based green cards, which are basically when you are related to someone who is sponsoring you for a green card. And, and that person who's sponsoring you needs to be either a US citizen or a permanent resident in the United States. Um, the, the relationship that's required differs. Uh, for each of those. Uh, but that's the first bucket is, is a family-based green card based on your relationship. The second bucket is employment-based green cards. So these are where you are requesting a, a green card based on either a business you have started that you run or a business that is in the United States that is essentially sponsoring you as an employee uh, at, at the business. Uh, so you see on your screen, in terms of the first bucket, uh, family-based green cards, um, there are two broad category, subcategories within family-based green cards. The first is immediate relatives. So this would include, for example, if you are married to a US citizen, your spouse is an immediate relative. Uh, your parents are immediate relatives. Your children are immediate relatives. Uh, unfortunately, siblings are not immediate relatives. Um, so if you are not an immediate relative, then you fall into what is called preference categories. So, um, so certain categories of family relationships are given a higher preference than others. And this is why uh, if you're an, an immediate relative, for example, the spouse of a U.S. citizen, the path to a green card is quite quick, whereas if you fall into one of these preference categories, there can be a significant backlog, such as if, if you are the uh, sibling uh, of, of a permanent resident or a U.S. citizen. Now, employment-based green cards uh, will go into much more detail for all of these categories, but you see on your screen that these are broken into certain subcategories, EB1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Um, EB stands for employment-based, 
EB1, those are green cards for those who have extraordinary ability. So these really are people at the top of their field in the world. Uh, EB2 is kind of a step down from EB1. Uh, these are people who, who also are, are highly uh, skilled, um, and we'll talk about the qualifications in a moment. Um, it does include national interest waivers. So national interest waivers are an option for entrepreneurs, for people who own their own businesses. And again, we'll talk about that more in a later slide, but a, a wonderful opportunity for, for entrepreneurs. EB3 are company sponsored green cards. Uh, so you do need to be sponsored by an employer. You cannot uh, self petition. Um, and the EB3 requires uh, that you go through what's called the PERM process, which is where you test the labor market. EB2 also has a PERM category. We'll talk about that later. EB4 is a category we will not actually be talking about on this presentation. These are green cards for those uh, who work in, uh, in re professions related to religion. Um, EB5 are green cards uh, for those who qualify based on an investment. Um, so uh, so basically, EB-5s, many of you may have heard of this. Um, these are green cards that, that currently you need to invest either $800,000 or a million and fifty thousand dollars into a, a business in the United States. And again, we'll go into more detail on the EB-5. Um, Specific to E2, so, so which of these are, are common for those who are on E2 visas? The two that really stand out are the EB-2, uh, specifically the National Interest Waiver, and the EB-5. So people who start off with an E-2, let's say that uh, they're starting a, um, a, a consulting company that aims to help uh, federal contractors. Um, you know, and, and let's say that there is an argument that they can make that the impact that they have as, as a consulting firm uh, is, is broad in its impact. Uh, the EB2 NIW could be a good option for them. Uh, or if you have a business that doesn't necessarily have a broad impact, but you can show that uh, it's a business where you've invested a million and fifty thousand dollars and that those funds then lead to the creation of 10 jobs. Uh, the EB-5 could be a good option. So those EB-2 NIW and EB-5 are, are the two common green card options that, that we see for E-2 visa holders. So for now, let's, let's quickly go over some family-based green card elements. As I said before, uh, there is a category for immediate relatives, such as uh, if, if the person who is sponsoring you for a green card is your U.S. citizen spouse, for example, uh, uh, or your U.S. citizen uh, child, child meaning 21 years old or older, uh, uh, then, um, or if, if you are the, the child of, of a U.S. citizen, those are immediate relative categories, and those are immediately available. In other words, you don't need to wait in a line for the visa. Visas are all, green cards are always available for those categories. If you are not in the immediate relative category, such as if you are the sibling of a US citizen or the sibling of a lawful permanent resident, you're put into a preference based category. And as I said before, those are limited in number. And so there can be significant backlogs and basically you're waiting for the green card to become available. If you want to see how long the current backlogs are, uh, you would look at what's called the Visa Bulletin. And the Visa Bulletin is issued every month by the U.S. Department of State. And basically what that is, is the reason there are categories is because of uh, the law, the immigration law that Congress passed. And basically when Congress passed the law, it said, that a certain number of green cards will be made available. And, and I'm using the word green card interchangeably with immigrant visa, but the, they are different, but we'll, let's lump them into the category. So basically green card or immigrant visa, Congress defined how many would be available uh, to uh, people in different categories, uh, whether that's family-based categories or employment-based categories. And um, when that number is taken up, then you have to wait until the next fiscal year when more uh, 
green cards are made available. So uh, what the visa bulletin does is every month the Department of State basically uh, uh, provides a, uh, a date per category. So it lists out the various family-based categories, it lists out the various employment-based categories. And for each category, it says when you need to have filed your application, uh, the, the green card application or the immigrant visa application, whether that's the I-130 or the I-140 or the I-526, when you need to have filed that application to be eligible to then actually apply for the green card. So this, this is a good chance to, to talk a little bit about the process. Um, so step one to apply for a green card is to file, if you are applying based on family, the I-130. If you are applying based on employment, the form I-140 or the form I-526 if you're applying in the employment-based five, EB-5 category. So that's step one, is you file the I-130, the I-140, or the I-526, depending on the grounds you're applying on. Those will go to USCIS. And essentially, those are filed by the sponsor, by the petitioner. So if, if you're married to a US citizen, the US citizen will file the I-130 with USCIS. Uh, and essentially what that application is saying is I am applying, I would like to apply for a green card for my uh, spouse um, uh, and here's how they qualify. And then the USCIS will look at the I-130 and if they agree, yes, the spouse qualifies, uh, then they will approve and essentially then step two begins. Step two is when you as the beneficiary, whether that's because you are the spouse of a US citizen or you are the employee whose employer has sponsored you, uh, you would then file the application for the immigrant visa or the green card. If you're applying for an immigrant visa, you would file a DS-260, and that is an online application that goes to the consulate. Um, and again, this is only after the first step is approved, or uh, you would file, if, if you're applying within the United States and do not want to go through a consulate, you would uh, file an I-485, which is an application to adjust status. Um, and one quick little nuance is that certain green card applications allow you to file the I-485 at the same time that you file the I-130 or I-140. So, uh, for example, if you're applying for an EB-5, uh, you can, and, and you're inside the United States, and uh, you're, you're not from uh, a backlogged country, so again, you'd look at the visa bulletin, but let's say you're a Canadian national applying for an EB-5 uh, green card uh, based on a, 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 an application in a targeted employment area. There is no backlog for that category. So you could file the I-526 and I-485 at the same time. It's called a concurrent filing. For other categories, such as let's say you're a national of China and you uh, have not invested in a targeted employment area, you've, you've invested in, in say a million and fifty thousand dollars for an EB-5, that category is backlogged. So you would need to wait until your visa is current, again, looking at the visa bulletin, before you file the I-485. And that assumes you're inside the US. Um, if you're outside the US, you'd need to wait to file the DS-260. Uh, so um, so uh, that, that's a quick overview of the process. The final thing I will add to the I-485 is this final bullet that you see on your screen, which is that when you file the I-485, you can concurrently at the same time file an application uh, to work, so a work permit, as well as a, a, an application for uh, uh, authorization to travel, so, so a travel permit. Um, those, those, you can only file those after you filed the I-485. Um, so that's a huge benefit to concurrent filing. So again, those EB-5 applicants, who currently have visas available, meaning uh, they're, for example, investing in targeted employment areas, and they're inside the US, they can file that I-485 along with the I-526 and at the same time file the work permit 
uh, application for a work permit and a travel permit. And once those applications are approved, meaning the work and travel permit, they can start working uh, in the US. And, uh, and once the travel permit's approved, they can travel. Before those are approved though, so the time between filing the I-485 and having an approved travel permit, you cannot leave the US without abandoning your adjustment of status application. So if, if that's you and you think you do need to travel, then our recommendation would generally be to apply at a consulate um, uh, so that you know, you're, you're not abandoning your adjustment of status application. Let's talk about some of these specific employment-based categories. The first one we'll talk about is the EB1A. And again, this is for those who have extraordinary ability. They are the top of their field internationally, and they meet at least three of the following. You see on your screen a list of several uh, criteria. And the, what the government requires is that you meet at least three of these. I've highlighted three of the most common uh, that we see in our applications, which is you include uh, proof that you have been asked to judge the work of others. Uh, for example, if you're on panels uh, and you're, you're judging their work, uh, you need to include evidence of your original scientific, scholarly, artistic, athletic, or business-related contributions of major significance to the field. That is another common area. Uh, another third common area is evidence of your performance of a leading or critical role in a distinguished organization. Um, and again, we're talking organizations that are, that are internationally uh, known and recognized evidence that you command a high salary or other significantly high remuneration in relation to others in the field. So those are four examples of the acceptable criteria. You, you can see the other uh, criteria on your screen that are accepted. Um, but again, this is a category, it is challenging. This is similar to the O-1 uh, visas uh, uh, criteria, but these are actually uh, a higher standard. So even if you have an O-1 visa or have had one in the past, that does not mean that you automatically qualify for an EB-1A. Uh, you, you, you do have a higher standard for the EB-1A. Now, the EB-1A does give you the ability to self-petition. That means that you don't need a separate employer to petition for you, which can be a, a significant benefit um, and, and means that entrepreneurs uh, can apply. And it is, as I mentioned before, it is a, a two-step process. You would first file the I-140. Uh, and I should say that an employer can sponsor you for an EB-1A. So even though entrepreneurs can apply, you can be sponsored by, by an employer uh, that, that, you don't, that you don't own. Um, so step one is file the form I-140 with USCIS. Step two is once the I-140 is approved, you either file the DS-260 with a consulate or the I-485. Um, so that is the EB-1A, the EB-2. The EB-2 is not as uh, high a bar as the EB-1. Uh, here we're going to focus on the National Interest Waiver and I'll just quickly say that there is a, a, uh, an option for an employer to sponsor a worker for an EB-2 and it would just be the EB-2 PERM option. Uh, I'll use the term PERM for um, uh, really for the next slide. The next slide we'll talk a little bit more about the EB-2 PERM option uh, where an employer is sponsoring you. But for now let's talk about the National Interest Waiver. This is actually a spectacular option for entrepreneurs and it is a fairly recent option. Reason being that in, uh, I believe it was 2017, the government issued a decision in a case called Matter of Danisar, which you see on your screen, where the government essentially made it explicit that the EB2 National Interest Waiver is suitable for entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs can qualify for these. And the government laid out several uh, bases, several criteria that you can satisfy as an entrepreneur to get a national interest waiver. Um, so you see these on, on your screen. Uh, you must prove, if you're applying for a national interest waiver, three things. First, a local or regional proposed endeavor uh, that could be of national importance. And national importance 
don't give it more weight than it deserves. In other words, you do not need to show that your business affects everyone across the country or that it affects states across the country. Um, you know, you, you can show national importance by addressing a significant issue. So for example, uh, the government has made it clear that STEM fields, science, technology, engineering, math, are of significant importance. So if your business actually, uh, you know, benefits a STEM field, uh, engineering, for example, that could be an argument you can make. If you are addressing a, a problem that the government has expressed uh, an interest in, so STEM is one example, there are others. Um, an example we like to use is um, a, a an organization that uh, was created to serve veterans and help them um, help them actually find employment opportunities um, that that was framed as of being of national importance. So so don't think it means that you're running a gigantic company that is selling to people across the country and employing people across the country. That's not what national importance has to be. So there there are ways to show that and it can be it can be creating jobs, even if it's in a socioeconomically depressed area, if you're creating a significant number of jobs, creating an economic impact or benefit to a specific community that's significant. Um, and you could also show this by providing expert letters that talk about how your business really is having a significant uh, national impact of national importance. The second uh, criterion is that the entrepreneur, entrepreneur needs to be well positioned to advance the proposed endeavor. So you do need to show how you are qualified to run the enterprise. And this, this is, is not an automatic thing to prove. Uh, you know, you do need to put effort into showing your qualifications, uh, you know, recognition you have received as the entrepreneur who will run this business. And the final of the three cri criteria is that the government, you need to show that the government should waive the labor certification process. Now, this is uh, an element that's typically not too hard to satisfy. And the reason being is that if you're applying for a national interest waiver as an entrepreneur, um, the labor certification process doesn't really apply to entrepreneurs. The labor certification process is really, it exists to show that you're not taking jobs away from qualified uh, US workers. Entrepreneurs don't really take jobs away from qualified entrepreneurs. Uh, they create jobs. That's that's in some ways the definition of an entrepreneur, right? Someone who develops a business and creates job opportunities for others. So that's the angle that that we would typically take to show this third uh, criterion, uh, which is that, you know, this is an entrepreneur. This is someone who's not competing in the domestic labor market. They're actually creating jobs for others. So therefore, the government should waive the labor certification process. Now, for an EB-2 to qualify, you do need to satisfy certain threshold requirements. The first is that you need to have an advanced degree. That means a master's degree or higher. If you do not have a master's degree, you can qualify based on having a bachelor's degree and five years of experience. And if you don't have that, you can qualify by showing that you have exceptional ability. And this is similar to what we were talking about before. Again, not as high a standard as the EB1A, but it is things such as uh, showing, you know, roles that you've had in uh, in your field, uh, publishing, uh, speaking at conferences, um, judging the work of others, getting grants, um, you know, it's, it's things like that where you are showing that others have actually, you know, uh, others believe that you have exceptional ability, ability, others in your field. So, so do keep that in mind as a threshold requirement for the EB2. Now, uh, I said before that there is another subcategory of the EB-2. There's the National Interest Waiver, which we talked about before, but there's also the PERM option for EB-2. Um, uh, now, PERM means that there is a, an employer in the U.S. that is sponsoring uh, you as a foreign worker who will be coming to the U.S. Uh, on an immigrant visa or a green card uh, to work for that company. And the PERM process is basically where the U.S. employer is testing the labor market uh, and showing the government that there is not a qualified U.S. worker for the job. 
Um, so what does this look like? First of all, the U.S. employer needs to apply to the U.S. Department of Labor for um, for essentially um, the the wage that they would pay to you as the applicant. And the Department of Labor needs to say, yes, the amount that is going to be paid to this position is actually approved by the Department of Labor. That process alone can take months. Um, after you have that wage, you would advertise the job. Um, you would advertise, you know, the job duties, and they they really would be the minimal requirements for the job. So you cannot add, you know, some uh, some some uh, skills or some uh, qualifications that you'd like to have, but you would hire someone without them. You really do need to advertise the minimum role, that the minimum uh, qualifications that would qualify uh, for for the job along with the wage. Uh, you need to publish that um, that position and you need to see if anyone applies and if qualified US workers do apply, then the process ends there and you cannot hire the foreign worker. However, uh, there are many, many, many times that there actually is not a qualified US worker. People may apply who are not actually qualified uh, or no one may apply for the position, uh, which happens more often than people might think uh, in which case you would you would uh you would apply to the government and show that no one has applied therefore we are moving forward with the i-140 application um so um just quickly going through there there are some audit triggers so for example if you say in your job posting that speaking spanish is a requirement for the job that is a trigger so the government does not like seeing that language is a requirement they do want to see that uh you know you really are looking for for really you know people who have other skill sets other than language uh that that are needed for this job um so and I mentioned before requirements that are outside those that are normally required for the occupation. Don't put an aspirational or like, you know, wish list um, uh, skill sets that you want for the role. It really needs to be the minimum that's that's needed. Um, and to quickly take a step back, EB2 is, is again, you know, a, a more skilled uh, category than EB3. Um, EB3 does include unskilled workers. Uh, so uh, so the EB3 is really just a broader category. It, it has lower requirements than the EB2 perm. And again, the, the process is to file the I-140 with USCIS first. Um, that's after perm, right? That's after the perm process has completed. Then you would file the I-140. Uh, and once that's approved, the I-485, if you're applying within the US versus uh, the DS-260, if you're applying at a consulate. Uh, where you get the immigrant visa and then come into the U.S. and immediately get your green card once you enter the U.S. Um, these categories do tend to be backlogged. So if you're interested in the EB-2 or EB-3, do check the visa bulletin. Uh, look at the November visa bulletin, which is out, and get a sense of the delays that apply to that. E2 to EB-5. So again, the EB-5 is a job creation green card that you, there, there are two broad uh, requirements for it. Now, again, there are additional requirements, but the two big ones, you need to invest a significant amount of money, and that is defined as a million and fifty thousand dollars or eight hundred thousand dollars if you're investing in an area of high employment, uh, an area that's rural or an infrastructure project. So a million and fifty is the standard amount, but you will oftentimes see opportunities to apply for EB-5 uh, applications through what are called regional centers uh, that are at the $800,000 amount. Uh, the investment does, if you're qualifying for the $800,000, another word, another term you'll hear used is targeted employment area. So that is, that's just another term for a rural area, an area of high unemployment. Uh, a new category is infrastructure projects. Um, but uh, TEAs or targeted employment areas are those that do allow you to apply with that lower $800,000 amount. The investment needs to be made in what is called a new commercial enterprise. And that's really just a business that's been formed since the 1990s. Um, and here is the second big requirement for the EB-5, which is the creation of jobs. 
your investment amount, whether 800,000 or a million and fifty thousand dollars, needs to go into a new commercial enterprise, a business that then needs to use your investment to create 10 full time positions for qualified workers. Um, full time means 35 hours a week. Qualified workers is U.S. citizens, lawful permanent residents, refugees, asylees. Um, OK, so uh, that is really key uh, those two pieces investment and employment um, we'll talk a little bit about the process for applying and when you would prove that you've yeah, you've invested the funds and that you've created jobs but uh, what investments can be included so the answer is a broad range of investments can be a gift uh, can be a loan if it's secured by your personal assets uh, can be income you've earned, can be an inheritance, uh, can be a property you've sold. Uh, however, the process of proving to USCIS where you got your money from is extremely demanding. USCIS basically does a financial audit, uh, and you will need to document each and every step that the, the funds traveled through. So in other words, if you got your money from selling a property. You need to prove that you own the property. You need to provide the contract of sale. You need to provide uh, the statements and transfer receipts showing the flow of money from the buyer to you. Uh, and then if it traveled through multiple accounts of yours, you need to show each step that those funds traveled through before they actually went to the new commercial enterprise. So if the funds were from a gift, uh, the person who gave you the gift is going to need to provide those documents to show exactly where they got the money. Uh, so this is a very demanding process. Go in with eyes wide open, start keeping all of your documentation. Um, and, and of course, uh, you know, this is something that we require you speak with an attorney uh, about because this is a, this, you know, you don't want to get down the road of applying and then find out that you just you're going to be denied based on insufficient uh, documentation. So uh, so that is that is an onerous part of this application process for the EB-5. Um, in, investment versus retained earnings. So they do need to be your your personal fund. So this comes up with an E-2. An E-2, usually, you know, you'll invest, say, $100,000, $150,000 into a business. Uh, the business will then get going. It will have retained earnings. And then it'll create jobs from those retained earnings. Those jobs likely will not qualify uh, toward the 10 full-time positions that are required for the EB-5. And the reason is that the positions created for the EB-5 need to be created from the investment of $800,000 or $1,050,000. And those funds need to be from your personal funds. And again, they can be a gift, they can be a loan, but they need to be your personal funds. They cannot be retained earnings in a business that have not been distributed to you. So if you do want to use retained earnings, you need to first distribute those earnings to you. You need to pay taxes on them. Uh, and then you can take that amount, 800,000 or a million and 50, put it back into the business and show how the jobs are created from that. Um, differences between the E2 and the EB5. There are many. Uh, the E2 is a non-immigrant visa, meaning that you do need to intend to leave at the end of your visa. It's fine to adjust status if eventually you find that that's a, a good option for you, but you don't enter on an E2 with the intention of adjusting status and applying for a green card. And EB-5 is a green card. So if you have it a certain number of, of years, you can qualify to become a citizen. Um, the E2 also does not require you that you create a certain number of jobs. Uh, typically, we, re we, requ we recommend uh, that you create at least three jobs over a five year period. But there's there's no hard and fast requirement as there is for an EB-5, which is 10 full time uh, positions for qualified U.S. workers. Uh, E2, you can also employ people who are on non-immigrant visas. It's a little less persuasive than those on green cards or U.S. citizens. Uh, the EB-5, you those those workers, although you can employ them, they're not going to count toward your 10. Your 10 cannot include uh, non-immigrant visa holders. Also, the E-2 doesn't have such a high investment amount, and it also doesn't have a specific investment amount. For an E-2, you need to invest a substantial amount, which is defined as 
basically enough to get the business operational. So oftentimes that can be $100,000 or frankly even less. Uh, the EB-5, it is a defined amount, 800,000 or a million and 50. If you're below that amount, you are not going to qualify for the green card. Challenges for EB-5 direct investors and regional center investors, um, source of funds. So I mentioned before, you need to document absolutely everything in terms of where the money came from. Um, now, I do want to quickly say that within EB-5, there are two subcategories. Uh, really two ways to apply for an EB-5. One is direct investors. So direct investors or standalone uh, applicants are those who basically are applying um, through a more traditional business structure. So let's say you're starting a restaurant in um, Miami, Florida, and you invest a million and fifty thousand dollars into the restaurant, and you employ ten workers. That is a standalone application. You are the one EB five applicant. Your business is the restaurant. You've invested the money. You've created the jobs. A regional center application is the second option, EB five option. And that allows you to essentially be a passive investor. So you need to invest the required investment amount. For regional centers, it's usually $800,000. And these projects are usually enormous. So this can be creating a resort for $100 million. There can be hundreds of EB-5 applicants based on this one project or regional center. You put in your $800,000. Uh, the building of the resort employs thousands of people. So, you know, you, your 10 are included in that, your 10 positions, uh, and you really don't have a direct role. You're, you're kind of a limited partner in the enterprise, but you're not actively running it as you would be as a standalone EB-5 applicant. And that's the regional center option. For people who are looking for a more passive role uh, and, and really just investing their money and uh, not doing anything else with the business, Regional center is a good option. Uh, for those of you who have an E2 business, for example, standalone is probably gonna be the option if you wanna continue running the business. Uh, I already talked about job creation, uh, 10 full-time jobs created from your investment amount. Um, now let's talk quickly about the process of filing the EB-5. Step one, after you, you've decided you, you want to pursue the EB-5, you file the I-526. And the I-526 is essentially going to lay out, you know, your uh, your qualifications for the green card. Uh, if your green card is not backlogged, uh, such as if you're investing in a TEA, you can file the I-485 at the same time, along with the application for work authorization and a travel permit, which will let you go into and out of the U.S. while your I-485 is pending. Um, so the I-526 right now is taking USCIS somewhere around five years to adjudicate. And uh, we, we believe that's unreasonable. We actually, clients who want to expedite the process, oftentimes will sue the government to come to a decision faster. Um, usually they'll wait two years um, and, and we will uh, sue the government if we believe that the delay has been unreasonable. Uh, and we've been successful on those lawsuits. So, but do keep in mind that if you, uh, you know, if you're just filing the I-526, you're looking at about a five year period before the government will decide that. Um, once the government has approved the I-526, they will look at your green card, conditional green card application. And that's the I-485 uh, or the DS-260. And basically if you're, I-485 or DS-260 is approved, you get a conditional green card for two years. At the end of those two years, you file what's called an I-829. And what that is asking the government to do is to remove the conditions from your green card. And what you're showing there is that you actually have invested the money that you said you would, and you've actually created the, the 10 jobs from that investment. So you do have time to create the 10 jobs. Uh, really, the deadline is going to be when you file the I-829. You need to show the government that you've created those jobs. In terms of uh, how long to leave your investment at risk, the government recently issued guidance that said for people who apply after March of 2022, um, they need to keep their investment at risk for at least two years. 
Uh, if you applied before March of 2022, it is longer. You need to keep your investment uh, through the I-829, which again, because the I-526 takes five years and the I-829 is another two years after that, you're looking at at, a, at least seven years of keeping your investment in. Some projects, that makes sense, right? You're, you're not really going to be able to get your funds out earlier. Um, but for for others uh, that can be a very long time. So a question came in, can the assets and cash of a US company gained with E2 Visa be used for investment for EV5 or do I have to show new investment excluding my existing company's assets? So basically the requirement is that the funds you invest in the EV5 need to be your personal funds. So you can use uh, you know, funds that you personally receive from your E2 company. The issue is they cannot be the company's retained earnings. You actually need to distribute those to yourself. You need to pay taxes on them uh, and, uh, and show that they're sitting in your personal bank account. And then you can move them into the move them back into the EB-5 enterprise that you're applying based on. So uh, so do make sure not to apply based on those retained earnings. Let's quickly talk about some other green card options. Uh, the diversity lottery, the government does make a certain number of green cards available each year to uh, people who have who who were born in countries that are relatively underrepresented um and and that's a lottery as the name suggests um it, it is random it's uh, we we do tend to see clients get these surprisingly even though the odds are not generally in their favor there is high demand for for the diversity visas but it is out there as a green card option there are also humanitarian based uh green cards we're not going to spend much time talking about that but basically if you're a victim of a crime, uh, you may have a pathway to a green card. Um, reach out if you have more questions about that. There, are, next next bullet is is related. Uh, one of the options uh, a U visa is available if you're helping the police with a crime. A U visa is not a green card, uh, but could could uh, eventually uh, the person could adjust status based on it. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then immigration reform. There's always hope. Uh, some hope that uh, the government will change its uh, immigration system. Uh, no idea what the odds of that happening are given the way Congress is now, but uh, it is very clear that there does need to be reform of our system. I think it's clear that we just don't have enough green cards or immigrant visas to satisfy the demand. Uh, uh, our belief is that uh, those who come to the U.S. to work or create jobs add a real benefit to the United States. So uh, more green cards, more immigrant visas are needed and and just the backlogs. Um, you know, USCIS taking five years for an I-526 petition is unreasonable in our opinion. So there needs to be reform. But when that will happen, we really don't know. Other considerations. We already talked about timing considerations for the EB-5. You can file concurrently if you're within the U.S. and your green card uh, or immigrant visa is current. Uh, sorry, your your green your green card is current. Uh, visa is current. Excuse me. Uh, and you look at the visa bulletin and see that it's current. Um, we talked about country specific quotas and how there can be significant backlog. So, especially if you are a national of China or India. Uh, which are not E2 treaty countries. Uh, so if you do have an E2 uh, business as a national of China or India, it is because you gained citizenship in an E2 country through investment, which is fine. Uh, but it is your it is your country of birth that the, decides uh, the country specific quota for an immigrant visa or a green card. Uh, for the E2 visa, it is the country that you have a passport from. So. So do keep that in mind. Um, you know, if you were if you were born in China but got citizenship in Grenada and got an E two visa based on that, you can get an E two visa. Uh, you know, in the past, uh, no problem. Now you do have to live in Grenada for three years. Um, but when you apply for a green card, you're going to be applying as a national of China, and that tends to mean you'll have significant delays. Um, Unless you apply based on a, a targeted employment area, which, uh, uh, you know, do keep that in mind, because by applying in a targeted employment area, now the government reserves a certain number of EB-5 green cards for 
for that category and that can really reduce the amount of time you're waiting so uh, regional centers typically like i said are in targeted employment areas so that can be an option there travel consideration considerations and visa expiration dates the important thing uh one one of many important things um uh, we've already talked about which is that by filing the i-485 you you can remain in the u.s once you file the i-485 uh, again, once your green card is current, you can only file the I-485 once the visa bulletin shows that you're current. But filing the I-485 does not let you work and it does not let you travel. So you need to file separate applications for a work permit and a travel permit once you file the I-485. Now, very important is that filing that first step, uh, so the I-130, the I-140, or the I-526 alone does not really give you anything. Filing those does not let you stay in the US, uh, so you do need to have some kind of underlying status. So if you are in the US running your E2 company, and let's say you file uh, an, an I-140 based on a national interest waiver, um, you need to maintain that E2, uh, that E2 status until you file the I-485. And that is very important, especially if your E2 is about to expire. Um, you do want to renew your E2 before you have a pending green card application on the books. And the reason is what you see on your screen, dual intent consideration. So a visa like an E2 uh, is not dual intent. And what that means is you need to intend to leave the country when you enter or receive an E2 visa. Uh, you cannot intend to enter the U.S. to adjust status, okay? Um, so that means if you have a pending green card application and you're applying for an E-2 visa, the consulate is very likely going to ask you questions about your intention to leave the U.S. Uh, and then again, when you're entering at the border, they're very likely to ask you about your pending green card application and whether you actually intend to leave the U.S. So to remove that risk, uh, it is generally a good idea to renew your visa um, so that you're not, uh, you know, you're not applying for a new visa with a, with a pending green card application. Parallel green card strategies, there is no prohibition to applying for more than one green card. So, you, you know, you can have a sibling who's sponsoring you for a family-based green card. Uh, that is going to take years uh, for, depending on what country you're born in, it could take 15 or more years before your green card is available, which means before you can even file the I-485. Um, but in parallel, that, that can be going on while you apply for an NIW or an EB-5, and you can see which happens faster, and you can go with the option that, that works out faster. There's no problem with that. And again, planning is key. So renewing your visa, <clears throat> thinking about what options are available to you, whether they're family-based, whether they're employment-based, whether it's self-petitioning uh, for an NIW, an EB1A or an EB uh, or a, uh, uh, an EB5 based on your standalone investment. Uh, it, planning really is key. And an attorney can really be a value add in, in the process. As you can tell, there are a lot of moving pieces. There are risks. Uh, so it is it is a good idea to speak with a qualified immigration lawyer. And I believe we covered all of the questions that came in. The questions were excellent. So um, I appreciate you all for taking the time this morning to join me. Uh, please do keep an eye out for the email that you will find in your inboxes. And we hope to see you on future webinars. Thank you so much.